Good morning, everyone. Welcome to BC201 course on Christian history and missions. Even before we could begin with our session, I request one of us to please lead us in prayer. Anyone? Sally, Jeffy, now, if you want to lead. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this beautiful day and for the class we are about to have. God, we before we start our class, we fix our eyes on you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for taking up the cross for us. God, you have called us, you have chosen us. As we read about all these revivalists, as we come to know about them, Lord, help us to keep burning for you. Uh, help us to have a great desire to do uh, great things in this life for you, Jesus. I place each and every one of my classmates into your hands, Lord. Be with them, guide them. You be their strength, you be their courage. I place Pastor Diana into your hands as she, as she teaches us. Uh, help us to open our mind and heart and listen to it and not just listen to it, but help us to be the doer of the word, Jesus. You be with us and guide us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jeffina, for praying. Well, as we're studying on revival and moments we will continue to study with the 20th and 21st century revivals and the moments that took place during that time so as we're continuing to study on that let's look into the revival that took place among the hippies uh, so called the jesus people in those days so the hippies generation uh, were very prominent in 1950s and 1960s saw scores of young people in the Western world lost in rebellious nature. They were, they, uh, this particular group was addicted to many things. It could, be, uh, it could be for drugs, alcohol, free sex, Eastern mysticism, and also uh, communal living. So in the eyes of the mainstream, they were losers, rejects, escapists, uh, plain, lazy, people and these people were looking for an easy way out so we see that there was an unusual move of god began among their very subculture that saw many turn to the lord with large numbers of a large number of people or hippies coming to faith in christ so this revival spark was dictated through a person named charles Chuck Smith in 1927. And his wife, Kay Smith, who reached out to the hippies in Costa Mesa, California. He started with a very small group of 25 people, and they had a Calvary chapel, went on to become a network of over 1,000 churches throughout the United States. And many hundreds were more joined in global. So he considered as one of the most influential figures in modern American Christianity. So many others were used powerfully of God in this revival among the young people of that uh, generation. So this moment later came to know as Jesus moment. The name was changed to Jesus moment. And the people in it were referred to as Jesus people, or simply they called it in their own terms as Jesus freaks. In fact, they maintained the same uh, uh, the attire, like the bell bottoms, plus Bible equals Jesus freak. So the Jesus movement began on the west coast of the United States in the late 1960s and early 1970, and it spread primarily across North America, Europe, and Central America. So we see that the Jesus movement influenced many church growth movements, including Calvary Chapel churches, 
or uh, the Hope Chapel uh, churches and the Vineyard churches, Fellowship House Church, Sheol Youth Revival Center, and there are many others also been impacted and carried over with this Jesus movement. And this Jesus movement also gave birth to contemporary Christian music, starting with the Mata, uh, Maranatha singers from Hillsong. So Jesus culture and many others, like one of the many highlights of the Jesus music was the use of guitar, drums and use of chorus and dancing in the spirit. So some very uh, well-known musicians and bands merged, including Petra, Keith Green, Andre Crouch, Barry Magure, Phil Kierke and several other bands were Watched. Although the movement waned by late 1980, it had left a huge impact on the mainstream Christianity. Not only, uh, you know, they reached the youth of that generation, but many of whom went on to lead large churches and Christian organizations, but also influencing church life and Christian worship. So as the Lord moved in this set of people, which were very hard to see that, you know, uh, uh, can their life be changed? Because they saw uh, this hippie's life is so miserable. But then you see how one minister, Lord, raised Costa to go and minister to this group of people, to the set of people. And through them, you see how Lord that there was a revival broke and many hippies life changed transformed it only it didn't change the life it transformed but it started impacting the uh, complete country and the others globally the same way the similar way god can inspire any of us in the class to pray for a certain set of people we may think, like, what can I bring a change? This one drop, uh, you know, it matters even in a big ocean, they say. But then when you pray, when you lift up that earnest pray, God can change that prayer. God can multiply that prayer. He can revive, we can bring a revival through that prayer. Maybe I just one spark, but then this one spark is enough to bring the revival fire among the group or set that you're praying for. Let's see what happened at 1970 at Hasbury College Revival. So as we all are part of a college, we set time to pray. But even the prayer movement, God can spark a revival no matter where we are praying. It can be we are we are praying at college, we are praying at our office place, we are praying at home. But an earnest prayer can definitely spark a fire for God. So what happened at Hasbury College in Melbourne, Kentucky? So they seem to be praying for revival on the campus from a very long time. And they also had encountered several revivals on their own campus. One was in 1905, and the other they encountered in 1950, and the other in 1958, and among others. So on Feb 3rd, 1970, during the regular chapel service, Team Cluster, P. Reynolds was scheduled to speak. So what happened? However, he felt led to invite the students to give personal testimonies instead of him sharing. So many on the campus had been praying for revival and were in an, you know, that expectant heart. So as soon as the invitation was offered or given to them, there was a large group of students waiting to speak in. So there was a powerful move of God that broke over in that situation in the chapel time. So there was an awe of God's presence there. 
people started confessing their sins, repenting, sitting in silence before the Lord, praying and weeping and singing. So it was as though the Lord has walked in. The, the presence was so tangible in that room. Now we see people didn't want to leave this place. The 1,500 seater chapel was completely packed. So classes were cancelled for a week. But even after classes resumed on Feb 10, huge auditorium was left open for prayer and testimonies. So the news of the revival spread across through various mediums like the newspapers and the television across the United States. So people were hearing the news. People flocked into Wilmore to worship along with the students. So Hasbury students and the faculty uh, became very um, familiar. They were invited around the states to share on what was happening in the college. So wherever the Asbarians traveled, revival followed with them. So by the summer in 1970, the revival had reached more than 130 other colleges, seminars, and the Bible schools. And many churches, according to the published account, it spread from New York to California and even to South America. Always remember, the revival is something like the fire that is contagious, that spreads wherever the people are moving and carrying that fire to. So no matter how long our prayer is, no matter how we pray, but when we pray with an earnest heart seeking God for a revival, the Lord will definitely answer that prayer. The Lord will definitely break through and, you know, He will make His presence tangible for us. Tangible for us. With that, I will move on to Rodney Howard Brownie in 1992. So it is called as the Laughing Revival. So Rodney Howard Brownie was a South African evangelist who had moved to US in 18, sorry, 1987. So just after two years, in April 1989, while he was ministering in a church at uh, Clifton Park, New York, the Lord sent a revival of signs, wonders, and miracles that took place in that meeting, which resulted people being saved, healed, delivered, and many were encountering the presence, the tangible presence of God, which was in a very unusual way. So this continued for a very long time, and they say even today. And early in 1992, they had something called a holy laughter. That is the joy of the Lord. They were, uh, the people went on laughing. There was a burst of laugh within them during the time of worship. So it would also break out even during the revival meetings. So consequently, uh, they were termed as uh, this, the whole uh, 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 revival was termed as the laughing revival. So in 1993, Randy Clark, a vineyard pastor at the time, who was hungry and desperate for more of God, heard of Rodney Howard Rodney's revival meetings, what was happening there. So Randy Clark went to this meeting. He attended this meeting and he met Rodney. And Rodney prayed for Randy Clark for more than uh, maybe over five times. And he was very hungry for more of God. Once Randy Clark returned to his own church at St. Louis, God began to release that supernatural outpouring in his church service as well. So even during the regional vineyard pastors meeting, 
news of this reached other pastors in the vineyard churches, including Pastor John and uh, 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 Carol Arnott in Toronto. So you see, this is always a fire. Revival is always contagious. You cannot contain that you cannot keep it just for your church for your city for your place the fire spreads and we see how it spreads to different places through pastors so what happened when uh, the vineyard church including pastor john and uh, uh, carol are not in toronto heard about it they came over they came over and they were ministered so even when uh, they had been praying for the more of God. So John and Carol were hungry for God and they went to experience what God was doing in the other churches in different places. So a high water mark was a, uh, was a powerful impartation of John and Carol are not received in November 1993 from Claudio Fredzin. When God was using powerfully in Argentina, so in John's mind, they had the picture of more of God as one where they would see a large number of people would be saved, healed, along with this burst of laughter. That is nothing but along with the joy of the Lord coming into them. So they want to see such things happen in their own church as well. So in Jan 1994, they were hosting a four-day conference on revival with Randy Clark. So the pastor of the Vineyard Christian Fellowship in Louisiana, Missouri. On the opening of that very night, it was on a Thursday, Jan 20th, 1994, there were about 120 people in attendance. Does this rem remind us of something? 120 people, where do we remember they gathered? Class, anyone know where we hear this 120 people gathering together? First to the upper room in yes. yes. Yes, in Acts chapter 1 and 2, we see that there were 120 people gathered in the upper room for the time of Pentecost. Yeah, I felt like, you know, we need to have a little bit of interaction with the class. I just paused there. Well, so what happened? When, when, when they had this meeting along with Randy Clark of, uh, 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 with 120 people in attendance at their church, and they started to share his testimony. Randy Clark started sharing his testimony. The ministry time began where Randy gave an invitation for people to come to the altar and share their experience. And that was the time when the people started experiencing an unusual presence of God that moved into the room. So what happened? When you see the manifestation of the power of God, there's always signs, wonders, and miracles in that place. So what happened here was people began shaking, trembling. Some fell over the floor under the power of the Holy Spirit. Some were bursting out in laugh. Some were crying loud. Some started speaking in tongues. And some were overcome by God's presence even before reaching the platform to receive prayer. So those who were sitting were touched and fell to the floor, unable to get up for several hours. So people present in an adjoining room doing a Bible study also felt an unusual presence, fell to the floor and began praising God. The meetings the following night kept increasing in number and an unusual move of God continued. So the revival did not come in the form it was unexpected. So in fact, this was an unusual with people laughing, crying, rolling and having strange manifestation. But the key was they were experiencing and being touched by the Father's love and receiving emotional and physical healing. 
So it is reported that by the end of 1995, 6 lakh people had visited Toronto from almost every nation of the globe. So they were about 900 first-time conversions in that same year. Many churches and ministries around the world had been impacted by this Toronto blessings. So some of these included the Holy Trinity Brompton Church in UK and the Bethel Church in Redding, California, and the Heidi Baker and uh, Heidi and uh, Roland Baker of Iris Ministries. And over 20 years thereon, and the uh, various other uh, ministries continued with the outbreak of revival. Part of this in the present revival of presence and God's glory started moving among them. That was wonderful, isn't it? The revival was carried, ministries were birthed. People who attended the meetings with Randy Clark, they went back and, you know, ministries were birthed, the revivals were impacting their city, their nation. This is how the Lord worked in this time, in the season. We also see a revival in India. Shillong revival. What happened? Well, in 2006, between 2006 to 2007, there was a revival fire of the 1904 Welsh revival that reached the Kasi Hills in Shillong, which is the capital state of Meghalaya. So in 1906, and from there, spread across northeast India. So in the preparation of the centennial, two years prior, the Presbyterian Church started engaging in prayer for another visitation of God. The revival started in, 19, uh, in April 2006 among the huge gathering of 1,50,000 people at the Marang Presbyterian Church. So during the afternoon prayer service of the Revival Sanitary Commemoration, people continued to sing and pray for hours, even in the rain. The Revival spread in the region, affecting many other local churches, mostly the Presbyterian. So people came under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and they miraculously converted. And uh, it was just not only uh, the people were transformed or uh, receiving Jesus as the Lord and Savior, their life was transformed, but they also saw the city, the whole place were impacting. Like the drunkards were delivered from the bondage that they were into for many years. They also saw the broken families were restored back to normal. There was something very unusual that was spreading across the city and among the people. So there were a lot of unusual events were reported with the children and others seeing the vision of Jesus or the heaven and the hell. And even the regular classes in the schools were disrupted. As the Holy Spirit descended on the children, they began to sing and cry and spontaneously so the plane wouldn't uh, and it also in one of the church in Malki Presbyterian Church which is in Shillong uh, this incident happened on September 5th of 2006 where a plane wouldn't cross it began to glue all of a sudden and it didn't it didn't happen just for a, a few seconds in a day, but then this glow started glowing and it continued to glow for several days. So you see, when whenever there's an earnest prayer for revival, our God is a God. As per the scripture, he says, you know, I hear what you pray, I answer your prayer. God is asking 
us today in the class, earnestly can you pray for a revival? Now, as we are listening to different revivals that is taking place, God is asking us, can you pray? I want to revive you. I want to revive your city, your city, the place the where you stay in, your church, your ministry. All we need is that spark of prayer, that earnest prayer that God is asking. We had a similar kind of incident that took place at our Bible college um, in 2017. That was a year when we started with a supernatural time of prayer in the afternoon after our classes. So we finish our uh, classes from morning 9 to 12. Then from 12 to 1, we have time of supernatural prayer. We call it a supernatural time of prayer, where we all our students come together, all the first years, second years. But those days, we had only two years. Okay, So the first years and second years, we all came together in the hall. We started praying. We used to pray day after day for God to minister to us. So one day in the afternoon, it is a normal time, okay? We have uh, on that day, which is after our classes, we took a break and we went. And during the lunch time, there was not many students at the college. They all have gone to their hostels to have lunch. Okay, during the lunch time, I was there at my desk. One of the students, he finished his lunch early and he entered his classroom. He was in his second year. So he entered the class and he just started strumming the guitar. I just heard him strumming the guitar. They, they used to practice, you know, some of the instruments in the afternoon time. They used to practice. So as he was strumming, in few seconds, it was not uh, usual. Okay, beat. And then he started to sing. He started to sing holy, holy, holy. That's all. He just started saying like holy, you know, holy. He just sang holy. He didn't move on to the next stanza or to the next line. He just kept singing holy, holy, holy. And it was continuous. And there was no one in the classroom. He was alone singing. In a few minutes. The others finished the lunch break and slowly they started coming into their respective classrooms. The first years went to the first year classroom. The second year went to, to the second year classroom. So it was time for us to start with our afternoon practical session. But I heard something not usual. The song continued and it continued again and again wholly. And I see even the others join in to sing. So I felt there was something happening. I felt there was a shift in the atmosphere. When I entered the class, by the time I entered the second year, I saw few of them were on their knees, few were fallen on the floor, and the others were crying and weeping into this classroom. So I didn't want to disrupt what was happening. And I sensed there was a presence of God, unusual presence of God in the classroom. So immediately I went to the first year class and I said, guys, come just join our second year and let's pray together. The minute I invited the first year students to join into the second year classroom, the students, as they entered the second year classroom, they started falling down. I don't know what happened. I'm just witnessing. I'm in, witnessing all this with my bare eyes. As the student entered the second year classroom, the first year students, they just fell in the presence of God. They were just falling, some way crying and weeping. All of a sudden, it was like somebody entering into the presence of God. Immediately, there was a change. Immediately, there was a manifestation. And, and the song started 
I mean, they continued. The worship leader was leading from, uh, you know, uh, the initial. He started to sing again. I saw the presence of God, and this room was, the classroom was getting crowded because they were all on the floor and ground and crying and weeping. I thought that we need to uh, get into a larger place, into a bigger hall. So slowly I went in and I requested the worship leader, can you move to the hall? Somehow we made a place on the floor for him to walk through because there were students lying on the floor. And as he moved through, slowly I requested everyone to join in the hall. The prayer just continued. Maybe we started at, at 1.30, they started, and it went on till about 3 or 3.30. I'm not too sure of the time, how long it went on. And in the hall, maybe we were 20 to 25 of us, both classes put together. They prayed, they cried, they started singing and Praying, it went on, and maybe around. I'm not sure of the time. We stopped at certain time, maybe three or three thirty. That is about two hours of prayer. They stopped, and every then I requested the students to share the experience, and they started to share about the experience that they had. They saw Jesus walk through it bits of them. They saw heaven open. They saw, they had witnessed angels ascending and descending. They Some of them were convicted of their sin. And some of them, in that meeting, they were birds to write songs. They started to write songs. And some of them, they were uh, gifted with the prophetic visions. You know, they could uh, um, they could share. Whenever they started the worship, Lord started ministering to them and they started prophesying clearly to people with the visions, with the clarity of the places even they have not visited. They started ministering to students with much clarity. And, you know, um, so the Lord started ministering to people. Some of them, they were just convicted. They were just filled with the love of God. Things changed. Things changed. And, and from then on, from that year on till now, at our uh, college on campus, we continue with our supernatural time of prayer. And we see the Lord faithfully, faithfully ministering to our students during this time. So, Let's move on back to our class. In 2015, we also see uh, another revival in India. We're talking about India, another revival in India through uh, Pastor Satish Kumar, who began with the Calvary Temple Church with 25 people in 2005. And in 2015, the church attendance grew to 1 lakh. 30,000 and it started growing. So, how did this happen? So, the emphasis of the Calvary Temple was preaching and teaching God's word. So, the use of media through the use of media and several other media, he could greatly enhance the reach of what God was doing through Calvary Temple. So, to know more personally about the founder of this church. He was born in 1971 in a very poor family in Hyderabad, India. So Satish Kumar took to the streets uh, as a young age and he fell in bad company. So his parents were greatly concerned about, you know, about his well-being and his future. Sorry, excuse me. So one day, Satish Kumar heard a street preacher, preacher share about Jesus. And he also witnessed people, people's life was started to change. So when he looked over that situation, he also made a prayer, Lord, is it possible that you could change me? And then with that, 
he attended a prayer meeting. So in the prayer meeting, they offered him an altar call and he came forward to commit his life to Jesus. So Kumar, uh, Satish Kumar joined a church and he started to uh, serve in the church in different activities. Uh, it can be in any area like, you know, voluntary service in the church. And slowly he started uh, equipping himself and he also was part of uh, Indian Evangelical Mission, that is the IEM, where they were known for the evangelical missionary work. So at the age of 21, Kumar started a vibrant youth fellowship group. And he named them as Calvary Youth Mission. So in 95, um, he sensed that he has received the call from God to build a very large mega church. But in realistic, nothing was significantly materialized with them for the next 10 years. So in 1995, he received a call. So what he did, he, uh, he also, uh, Satish Kumar also started a tele uh, television ministry, which he could not sustain because it was costing him financially big and he could not uh, uh, sustain that uh, uh, amount which he required to run that ministry. So uh, he traveled to many places to raise funds. He went to US, but he was not very successful in getting that amount. And on ongoing don donations. So in 2005, Satish Kumar started the Calvary Temple Church with about 25 members. And by 2015, that is about in a decade, the church grew. The church grew to 1,30,000 members and it added 60,000 in the last three years alone. So in 2018, membership at uh, Calvary Temple stands at 1,95,000 people. So despite opposition from various groups, including agencies of the local government, Kumar urged his team of followers to build the aforementioned the mega church in a record time. How? He sensed that Lord has called him uh, to build a church in 52 days, just like how God instructed Nehemiah from the Old Testament to build the wall of Jerusalem in 52 days. How just how strategically Nehemiah planned the people and uh, how he worked day and night and how he faced encounters from the local people. In a similar way, Satish Kumar also faced a uh, problem from different people locally among the government and the others. But then as he prayed and he believed that he believed that Lord would help him to complete uh, uh, complete this church building project within 52 days. And he also encouraged the people to be part of this construction. As he encouraged the church people to be part of the construction, he was also one among them. So he was there uh, from, you know, laying the foundation to building the pillar to do everything. The church work continued night and day. So it was very, uh, as a leader, he was there. He was there practically putting his hands into the plow and, and trying to build this and trying to have. So as he was there, exactly in 52 days, Lord strengthened him and the steam people to complete this mega building church, which has the capacity of nearly uh, 18,000 to sit. In natural, it is impossible for anyone to get this church constructed in 52 days. But then the Lord helped. Lord helped people. You know, people just flooded in to help pastor. People just came in as church people, folks, uh, workers, laborers, everyone. They were just there to get this building project built and done in 52 days. So the church, uh, you know, uh, the church was not built in 52 days. Uh, like it, it, Sorry. What it says is 
the church was built in 52 days, but it was very difficult to be built in 52 days, but it only happened by God. It only happened by God. Though Pastor Satish Kumar faced a lot of challenges, a lot of problems during this construct construction time. But as God promised him that he will help him to build the church in 52 days, the promise was kept. The promise was kept. And uh, Pastor Satish Kumar says, it is definitely the Lord's doing. And he gives all glory to God. So they conduct uh, a three to four service in a day in the local language of Telugu. And there is one, uh, uh, one service in English. The church grew drastically. And now they have about two lakhs people in their church as members. So this is one of the ways that the Lord moved through Pastor Satish Kumar in, um, uh, in, uh, 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 of the Calvary Temple Church, which is standing strong and the ministry is still growing and flourishing. So what are some of the key observations that we see uh, uh, in this revival and movement? We see that the Reformation, Revival, Restoration, Missions and the Church growth that took place in the revival. We also saw there has been a season of global revival that took place. So, uh, like uh, we we saw, I'm just giving a, a you know a highlights of what we have already covered about these revival. So we saw the season of revival that took place during the Great Awakening time, and it didn't stop there. We also saw the Second Great Awakening revival. And then we saw another awakening, that is a third great evening, which felt across North America and Europe. We also saw how the revival moved from New York to the other places, uh, to uh, Northern Ireland, Wales, Scotland, England, Jamaica, South Africa. And then we saw there was, a, uh, there was another revival, that is on Pentecostal revival that took place. And even the Pentecostal revival swept across the globe almost on every continent. So what we understand here, that God is releasing his power, just not in one region, but he is spreading it, he's replicating it to the other regions of the world. So this has been the pattern of working that we see in the revival. Revival is always a fire that has been caught and moved from one place to the other. And we also see during this revival, the Lord is moving the church forward, disciplining the people, the city, the state, this transformation. Ministry leaders have been raised. New ministries have been birthed during this time of Thirdly, we also see that those ignited by the revival became the carrier of the revival. So they were individual missionaries who have been, uh, you know, who have been caught up with this revival fire and they became the carrier of the revival to their own regions. And we also see, fourthly, focused, intentional pursuit of God often paves the way for revival. When the set of people or the group of people, when they were focused and intentionally raising prayer with an earnest heart, asking God, revive me, revive my place, revive my church, revive my people, you see God answering their prayer and coming in His presence. That group or the individual prayer was earth which paved the path or the way for revival. Fifth, we see sharing revival stories often ignites revival. This is very important. This is one of the reasons why we share the revival stories. And after each revival story, we are just applying it. We are just looking into how it can affect us, how it can happen in our own time, how revival can happen in and through us. Because it's not to do with us, it's to do with the Lord. All we have to do is come to the Lord with an earnest prayer. 
So when we come to the Lord with earnest prayer, God uses that to stir our hearts, stir people's hearts, stir the city, church, everyone's heart. And here we see the revival, the revival fire ignites and burns and moves on. So today, as we have heard uh, the revival and the movements which took place in 20 and 21st century, and uh, common people like us who, who just prayed, just like us. And the Lord did great signs and wonders and miracles among them. Today, class, we are listening week after week, we come and we hear how the Lord worked. Let's just not be only the hearer of the word or hearer of the miracles, the hearer of the revival fire that has been spreading. Can we also pray? Can we also pray asking God, God, let that revival happen in and through us. Let that fire spark in and through us. Can we pray? But um, I, I have missed one person in this. That is Paul Yungi Cho, who had the biggest church and have the biggest church even now. This is the biggest church. And he was from a Buddhist background. Buddhist background. And at a very young age, at the age of 17, he received Jesus as the Lord and Savior when a young girl uh, from a school ministered to him prayed for him and he was healed from the tuberculosis that he was suffering from, which was, uh, you know, he was almost in his deathbed. But when this school girl continued to come and pray, kneel next to him and pray, and she shared about the Jesus of the Bible and gave him the Bible, the one who was so, uh, uh, you know, uh, against Jesus, started to hear and receive Jesus as the Lord and Savior, and he was also healed from the tuberculosis. This one incident, simple act, changed his heart, revived his heart. He was a simple boy from a slum at Korea. When Lord touched him, he, he didn't have any great knowledge. He started reading and he, he joined one of the Bible school that was run there by the uh, English people. And he learned English very fast and he started to study in a very simple way he started the church in his own home with a small table inviting people but the lord moved the lord moved so greatly because his heart and thirst was to reach out for people for jesus he wanted to know the gospel of jesus who touched and healed people is real because he healed him the very impact, the very understanding that he had about Jesus, the very understanding that he had about God was so huge, just that he wants to know, he wants people to know about this real God. And here you see today, this church is the world's biggest church, which has two billion members. To know more, I recommend you to please log in and search on. David Yonggi Cho or Paul Yonggi Cho. It's both are his name. He just had a name change at some point of his time from Paul Yonggi Cho to David Yonggi Cho. So please read about his personal encounter with the Lord and what made him to do what he did. He did face a lot of challenges in the ministry, but nothing stopped him from serving God. And God lifted him up. Through him, the ministry grew in South Korea. And you see, that is the biggest church across the world, across the globe, of 2 billion being the members of the church. So I know we have run out of time. So can I request one of us to please uh, pray so that we can end this last, uh, class with a word of prayer. We can pray for a revival. We can ask God, God, revive us. Let there be a revival in and through us, in our city, in our church, in our place, through us.
of anyone. Anyone can pray. John, would you like to pray? Yes, but let's pray. Yeah. Father, we thank you for this time. Lord, we open ourselves once again for your presence as we heard today of what has you used your people mightily in different areas, different seasons, different years. We pray, oh God, in this generation, help us also to be channel of your glory, channel of your presence, and we would impact people around us, oh God, and wherever city that we reside. We pray, oh God, that let there be revival in our places. Let the, uh, the atmosphere change, oh God, when we walk in. We pray, Lord Jesus, let the glory of God manifest as your people walk uh, and do your word, Lord Jesus. Let, uh, help us to work out the salvation. Help us to live like you. We pray, O oh God, enable and equip each one of us to be channels of your glory, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for joining in today's session. Thank you. God bless.